so I'll be talking and giving some background from my perspective, and then Dario is going to come in right after that, and then we'll go to questions for both of us at the very end. Um, so just to get started, a lot of this talk is going to be about risks from AI, um, because that's the area where I think we can make the biggest difference right now. Um, but I'm really motivated by the potential of AI. I see like a really uh, large chance that AI will have a hugely positive transformative effect on society. I think you can already see uh, some of that over the last you know, 30 years or something. But um, I think maybe the best framing for the talk is going into AI with our eyes open, like trying to really assess the range of outcomes and possibilities that, that exist in this space. And just trying to, to, to consider what the different ways we could make a difference are uh, without assuming that it's going to be all about risks or all about benefits or that there's some conflict between those. Um, so all that said, I do think that the biggest opportunity we have uh, for doing good today in this area is recognizing and dealing with risks. Um, I just don't want to lose sight of the goal, which is putting society in a position where we can realize the benefits of AI um, and avoid the risks. Uh, let me set up a timer so that I don't go over here. Stepping back, um, I think a productive way of looking at artificial intelligence is to think about things that have happened in history and try to figure out kind of what buckets artificial intelligence could, could fall into. Um, and my general view is that we might see AI systems at some point in the future that... Uh, that are really broadly transformative of, of society in general. And we might compare them to uh, the agricultural, agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, or the advent of language and collective learning in humans. Um, I think this is like uh, the biggest scope that it makes sense to think about the impacts of AI on. And I think it's really worth considering um, because some things in history do turn out to have this kind of impact. Like there's going to be something that has this kind of impact. Um, and, uh, uh, and if AI is something that could have this kind of impact, I think it's a possibility that's really worth taking seriously. Um, so what kinds of reasons can I give for, uh, for thinking that this might be the case? So I'll give a few sort of like paradigm cases that I use when I'm thinking about this that, that make me feel good about, uh, about thinking that there's some probability that we might want to put AI on this kind of diagram, looking back on it in the future and say like, well, there was language, Agriculture, industry, and artificial intelligence, which is a pretty, uh, uh, it's a pretty intense claim to make. Um, so the first mechanism that I think about is uh, we could see AI systems that are increasingly capable of doing all of the kinds of tasks that go into scientific and technological research and development. Um, so right now, this mostly looks like amplifying the capabilities of human scientists and human engineers. But looking forward, it seems really possible that AI systems could autonomously perform most of the tasks that, that humans uh, do today in that, in that process. Um, so you could imagine an AI system downloading papers from archive, could design experiments, uh, identifying key open questions about how the world works, uh, and designing new technologies that take advantage of, of the things that it learns. And if that's the case, I think it is possible that we could see a really rapid increase in the rate of technological and scientific progress in the world. Um, because it would be possible to turn capital into new research and development uh, without being bottlenecked on sort of like the really small number of human experts that are available to do this work. Um, so this, I think, draws a really direct analogy to something like the Industrial Revolution, where society sort of reorganized and was able to apply much more pressure to making progress on science and technology, and where we see, saw really broad changes in the world as a result of this. Um, sort of broadening this, uh, it seems like there's a reasonable chance that AI systems will eventually be cost competitive with humans at basically every economically valuable task. Uh, and that, that would be a pretty big deal. Um, the picture that I tend to turn to is this one of fuel use during the Industrial Revolution. Um, so you can think of this bottom line with biofuels as being sort of like uh, labor that's mostly done by humans. And then as you see these new uh, energy sources moving in, not only do those energy sources uh, 
expand energy use a lot on an absolute scale, but as a proportion of energy use, uh, non-biofuel energy sources came to take up like more and more of, of humans' influence on the world. I think we could see a really similar picture with artificial intelligence, where most of the things that we do right now that are economically valuable or really that, that, um, that influence the world right now go through humans, groups of humans working together, doing things. Uh, and we could see something like this where as AI systems can take on more and more of these tasks, more and more of our influence flows through AI systems that are doing things on our behalf. So our influence would then be more indirect than it is now and could, uh, could ramp up much more quickly than it would if it's bottlenecked again on, on human expertise and, and the availability of human labor. Um, so this, I think, by itself, uh, seems like it could be a pretty big deal. It uh, seems worth, worth paying attention to. But sort of looming all over all of this is that in a lot of domains, AI systems don't like go up to some level of human capability, which is sort of a weird way to think about AI because uh, AI systems have a really different um, sort of distribution of capabilities than humans do. It's, it's not like a one-to-one -one mapping between human skills and, and AI capabilities. Um, but in a lot of domains, AI systems reach human capabilities and then are able to go past them. Uh, and I think that uh, there's not a lot of reason to think that humans or groups of humans are at or near peak performance for most of the kinds of tasks that we care about. So in this case, we might see a much stronger version of the picture that we were looking at before um, and a strong fit with the Industrial Revolution where we saw um, not just substitution for human labor, not just machines doing all of the things that humans did before the Industrial Revolution, but also machines that could do many things that humans just couldn't do at all in niches where that made sense. Um, so uh, these are... Uh, these are sort of like three paradigm mechanisms that I like to think about uh, in this area. And I think it's important to think about many different pathways that AI could take because it is so hard to predict what, uh, what future progress in AI will look like and where the biggest applications and impacts will, will occur. Um, as a side note, I don't think that artificial intelligence, if you're looking at the world and at history and trying to figure out what the next thing on this kind of like, uh, um, uh, timeline of transformative events is, I don't think it makes sense to just think that there's going to be one thing that is the only thing that can possibly be the next step. Um, I think some other areas that make sense to keep an eye on are biology and synthetic biology. Uh, all humans have bodies. Uh, dramatically changing our ability to understand and modify the human body and brain would seems likely to have a pretty big impact on the world. Um, extremely cheap and scalable energy sources just historically have, have um, there's a causal story that, that those cheap and scalable energy sources are behind the industrial and agricultural revolutions. So I think that's worth paying attention to. And then there are sort of like transformations that uh, don't look as optimistic as historical ones. So large scale nuclear war or pandemics, particularly synthetic pandemics, could be significant milestones in the story of human history, but not in a positive direction. Um, so I think that artificial intelligence is not sort of like the only piece on the board if you want to think about history this way. Uh, but it is the one that, that I focus on. Um, as far as predicting when this will happen, uh, I think that this question is really hard to make any kind of headway on and feel very confident about. It's not, in my opinion, really reasonable to, to have a high degree of certainty about what kinds of AI progress will uh, will happen if you start looking out a decade or two. Um, for the work we're doing, uh, we think that there is at least a 10% chance that uh, technology that would enable this kind of transformative AI capability could, uh, could be possible in the next 20 years or so. Um, I'm not going to get into all the reasons. I'd be happy to talk about them later. Uh, but it's not really out of scope with the kinds of predictions you get when you ask, for example, like the published authors at major machine learning conferences, what they think about these questions. It's not clear that people have really good calibrated methods for making these predictions. So I don't put a lot of weight on, on these predictions or our predictions, but you, you have to start somewhere. Um, uh, I also want to reemphasize that I think AI is doing a significant amount of good today. I'm about to get into the part where I talk about potential risks. Um, uh, most of this good is probably through uh, 
through technologies that used to be thought of as artificial intelligence. So like uh, a lot of topics in computer science like search used to be thought of as AI. Now we just think of them as, as software engineering. Um, and uh, I think it's reasonable to expect future developments, even these transformative developments, to bring really large benefits in the future, as long as we can avoid the risks. Uh, also, I'm hopeful that many people in the future will be aware of potential risks and benefits and will work hard on these problems. So I don't think it's the case that the world is just you know, hurtling towards something and no one is paying any attention. Um, but I think that, that every bit of incremental work in this area uh, counts. Um, so let's talk about risks. Uh, the first category uh, out of the two categories I'm going to talk about are strategic risks. So these have to do with the way that influential actors like governments or developers of AI uh, respond to the, uh, the prospect of really transformative AI occurring um, and what they do as AI continues to progress, what outcomes they hope to achieve, and what policies and methods they use to try to get those outcomes. Um, so going back to this picture from the Industrial Revolution, you can imagine that uh, if a lot of influential actors thought that the world was going to look like this graph uh, with artificial intelligence taking up you know, that increasing slice of the pie, they might also think that groups that have an advantage in AI development would have significantly more influence over the world in the future. There could be this redistribution of influence over the world. Uh, and that could lead to a couple, I think, pretty significant risks. Um, the first one is misuse. So uh, authoritarian governments, criminals, or terrorist groups could use AI for high-impact cyber attacks, uh, development of biological or other new kinds of weapons, social manipulation or control, uh, or extreme surveillance. And just as a general principle, if artificial intelligence makes a small group of people a lot more powerful than, uh, than everyone else in the world and a lot more powerful than they've been historically, I think that, that we just run uh, a pretty significant risk of this type of misuse. Um, and also that the effects of this muse could, misuse could be really long lasting or even permanent. So it seems possible to imagine some kind of stable authoritarian state or that the damage from a conflict incited by misuse of AI could, uh, could do like really significant harm to humanity's trajectory overall, take like a long time to recover and we don't know what shape we would be in when we do recover. Um, the other area is preemptive conflict. So if governments see AI going this way, they may uh, try to take actions or, uh, or take steps to uh, make sure that they have the ability to, to defend their interests in the future. If a strong advantage in AI is like a critical um, resource that, that, that groups need in order to defend their, their interests, then rapid progress in AI could be sort of a destabilizing force, could like increase tension between possibly competitive uh, states or other influential groups. Um, and it might even be viewed as a threat on the level of something like nuclear weapons, which really changed the game when they came onto the scene. Um, uh, I'll talk in a little bit about interaction between strategic risks and some other risks that we see of accidents, uh, because if we see something where uh, multiple influential groups are racing to gain an advantage in artificial intelligence, it seems unlikely that they'll want to invest as much as maybe they would if they weren't racing uh, in making sure that AI systems are safe and reliably controllable. Um, so the prospect of transformative AI uh, could be really globally destabilizing even before we account for the things that people could use artificial intelligence for. And then also misuse of AI once, once it becomes really transformative could sort of like bend the trajectory of the world towards, towards something that's uh, a lot less good than it would be otherwise. Um, as a foundation, our basic strategy in this area has been field building. Uh, we think that there's one scenario where these kinds of strategic risks uh, become apparent relatively late in the game. There are basically no professional researchers in strategy who have been thinking about these issues for five or 10 years devoting 50 or 100% of their career to trying to figure out how we would deal with these kinds of things and what likely scenarios and outcomes are. Uh, and there's another world we can see where uh, instead that field has been supported and growing uh, and that there are these researchers who can be called on when they need to do important work to inform influential actors about what kinds of strategies are most likely to lead to good outcomes. Um, so we want to do what we can to sort of like 
grow those fields and facilitate researchers who want to figure out the answers to these strategic questions, or even figure out what the right questions are at this stage, really. Um, it also incidentally seems like uh, computer security, uh, operational security, and machine learning security are really promising areas in strategic risk in a world where no particular developer can defend against having their development stolen by another group. It seems much more difficult to keep things stable and to avoid uh, um, these misuse kinds of scenarios. Uh, so a second, the second category of risks that I'm going to talk about are accident or misalignment risks. Uh, and these have to do with uh, catastrophic unintended consequences. So not anything that any particular group wants to achieve, but something that seems like it, it could happen nonetheless. Uh, this is the focus of Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence. It's the thing that, that most often seems to get talked about in this area. Um, so the way we think about this is that today, most cutting edge AI systems are trained to maximize a well-defined reward or loss function on a particular training distribution. Uh, so an AI system might be playing a video game over and over again and learning how to change its behavior until it can achieve a really high score. Uh, having that score is key to guiding the learning. We don't really know how to train AI systems uh, without having that kind of concrete score. Uh, or in a way that will capture uh, the behavior that we want that isn't reflected in that score. So you get what you train for. Uh, and in many cases, it seems like we don't know how to, to train for the, the kinds of things that we want. Um, and that's because for many tasks we care about, we don't know how to design these cheap, well-defined rewards. Um, so we can imagine a situation where our ability to train AI systems to achieve uh, these well-defined tasks really outpaces our ability to achieve less well-defined tasks like help humanity thrive or act in the way that we'd want you to. Um, and in worst cases, so for example, we can imagine a hedge fund deploying an AI system to maximize its profits. Uh, similar to the way we see video game AIs today finding exploits or finding unintended strategies. So it racks up a high score but isn't really playing the video game the way we wanted it to. Uh, we could imagine this hedge fund AI system uh, devising like some new plan to commit uh, maybe very subtle cybercrime or manipulation of markets. Uh, it would maximize the score that it was trained to maximize, but not, not achieve the, the, the outcomes that we would really like from it. Um, and in the worst case, you could imagine a system like that figuring out um, how to develop sort of radically new technologies, including weapons or persuasive technologies or ways of manipulating humans. Uh, and in a sense try to optimize the whole world around the goal of making profits for this hedge fund. Um, I don't think that the outcomes would be very good for anyone, including the hedge fund managers in that case. Um, and in that case, our ability to build AI systems that can stop other AIs from doing damage or that can make sure that our aims are achieved in the future, those kinds of like vague and hard to define goals um, building those AI systems is not something that we currently understand how to do. Uh, so we see a lot of value in finding some way to train AIs, AI systems to pursue goals that are actually pretty poorly defined, uh, because that's the kind of thing that most humans ultimately care about. Um, a second category within misalignment risks, I've just used the illustration. I think you already had a talk on adversarial counterexamples. Is that right? A talk on information security. Oh, OK. Um, I think there's a talk coming about adversarial counterexamples that will be much better than my explanation here. But basically, we just see on the left an image from the kind of uh, data set that, um, that image classifiers are, are trained on. Uh, in the middle are distortions, and on the right, images after the distortions are applied. So the distortions are calculated to cause the AI system to classify all of these images as ostrich instead of whatever they're supposed to be classified as. Um, I don't, uh, I don't think it makes sense to project exactly this kind of failure into the future. It's hard to predict what kinds of progress we'll see. But this is a good illustration of the general uh, situation where uh, an AI system encounters a kind of input that it wasn't really designed uh, to handle well or wasn't trained to handle well. Uh, and we can imagine that with powerful enough AI systems that uh, this kind of mistake could lead to really bizarre and harmful outcomes. Um, so returning to the picture above, the real thing that we're thinking about on misalignment risks is a world where most human influence in the world goes through AI systems that are acting on our behalf, but
but we're not able to train them to act on our behalf in a way that, that respects these hard to define values and that, uh, that's robust against the kinds of inputs it might see when it's deployed that it didn't see when it was trained. Um, these seem like, these technical problems might be obstacles to capability just as much as they are to safety. Uh, so in a sense, it makes sense to just lump all of this into AI research and say like, well, the goal is to make machines that do tasks well. All of this is normal AI research. It doesn't make sense to separate it out into alignment, misalignment, safety. Um, I think that, that that's like, there's, there's a grain of truth to that. Uh, to that. Um, we might hope that normal progress in AI will solve these problems at the same rate that it's solving uh, the problems required to make systems that are really capable within distribution on well-defined tasks. Uh, but I think it makes sense to separate these out and make sure that these, uh, these sort of like um, uh, separate progress bars are keeping up with each other. Um, so our approach in this area is field building as well. And here things are a little bit more concrete because there are, uh, I think, a lot of problems in machine learning and AI more generally right now that are just super relevant to robustness against adversarial examples or distributional shift. Those are topics people are already studying uh, or that are relevant to training systems to achieve goals that aren't particularly well defined uh, and that, that we don't know how to define in the, in the typical paradigm. Um, so uh, groups in academia and industry are working on these problems and a lot of these groups have sprung up in the last few years and are growing at a pretty rapid rate. Um, as a foundation, most of what we do is work with academic researchers, uh, they're the ones who we can support most. Uh, but I think there's also really exciting work going on at industrial labs, particularly uh, DeepMind and OpenAI, uh, and collaborations between all of these groups, which um, I'm very hopeful for this field to sort of grow into a unified whole uh, over the next few years. So I'm gonna pass things to Dario to fill in some of these blanks and uh, look forward to questions afterwards. Cool. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Dario Moday. I lead a team at, at OpenAI that uh, does, does work on uh, um, uh, making, making AI systems safe and uh, putting, putting, putting humans in the loop. So, uh, you know, I've been, been in the AI field for about, uh, about three years. And I think, think about two years ago, you know, when I first entered deep learning, I was uh, particularly impressed with something about deep learning systems as, as an outsider to the field, which is that uh, you found they could be very powerful. So the first thing I worked on was like a speech recognition system. And, uh, you know, you, you could see just how many subtle correlations the system could figure out. And yet, uh, if you just change something very simple, uh, you, could, you could completely break the system. So if you trained a speech recognition system almost entirely on, uh, you know, um, you know, American accented speech, and then you gave it gave it some British accented speech. It would, you know, it would completely break. And uh, you know, of course, if you train on a number of accents, then you get somewhat better at generalizing to uh, to to, f to further uh, uh, accents. But you know, this this mix of incredible power, kind of opacity, and and uh, and unreliability, um, really kind of you know ga gave me the sense that you know an important direction in this field is to. Um, you know, to, to, try, to try and figure out that, make sure that these systems do what we, we kind of want them to do. And that, that was around the same time there was kind of the, you know, the, the like Andrewing overpopulation on Mars versus Elon Musk summoning the demon, um, you know, uh, kind of a, a, a public, public debate on, on AI. And, and you know, something, something I kind of felt about it was, you know, um, you know that while, while many people in the field kind of liked Andrew Ng's response, said, oh, you know, there's, there's nothing to worry about. We're not, we're not doing anything evil. Um, you know, I, I didn't really found it satisfactory because I feel like, you know, whenever we have a powerful technology, it, it has a lot of upsides, but it also has some, some downsides as well. And instead of dismissing the downsides, we should be trying to, uh, you know, minimize the downsides and, and maximize the upsides. And that's what uh, truly, truly responsible behavior is. Uh, uh, looks like so. I uh, eventually found my way to OpenAI, and uh, you know I'm I'm kind of working on that. So uh, often uh, when I when I have to give give you know like a recruiting talk for OpenAI or something, I start by talking about all the the great things OpenAI is doing. But I'm I'm not gonna gonna do that here. Um, 
this is what I think about at OpenAI, right? O OpenAI works on, on all kinds of, uh, you know, wonderful and positive uh, applications of AI. And I think that, you know, overall in the world, the wonderful and positive applications will probably, uh, will probably dominate. But, uh, you know, my, 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 my job is uh, kind of considerably more depressing than that I'm the person at OpenAI who thinks about all the possible things that could go wrong. Um, so, uh, you know, I generally kind of divide these into a uh, few categories, and I'll mostly be talking about uh, uh, the, the, the last one here, but we'll try and touch on the other ones. Uh, Daniel kind of already made some of these divisions, but, uh, you know, if you, uh, one, one category is misuse. You know, whenever you have a powerful technology, and particularly one that advances fast so that you have disparities in technology, then, uh, you know, there, there are many ways that technology could be misused by people with uh, bad values or bad intentions. Um, so, uh, you know, examples of these are things like uh, drone weapons, uh, mass surveillance that might be enabled by, uh, you know, advanced, uh, advanced speech recognition at scale, uh, advanced hacking, um, and ultimately kind of mil military arms races, where if you have a technology that is the key to, uh, you know, scientific and technological progress, as well as uh, mi military strategy, then a lot of governments are going to be interested in it, and they're going to use it adversarially against each other. Um, the second category is what you might call uh, social side effects. So things where it's not there's no particular person is misusing the technology, but you know never n nevertheless something bad happens that's kind of more related to po policy than uh, something going wrong technically with the technology. So uh, you know uh, worries about unemployment and uh, and automation ideas that uh, you know bringing ML systems into uh, you know their use in the in the criminal justice system could uh, kind of kind of subtly exacerbate uh, existing biases and create unfair outcomes. Um, weaponized fake news. Um, I think that in a few years it'll probably be possible to make uh, a, 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 you know, a purported video of uh, anyone basically saying or doing anything, and uh, it'll be very hard to tell that from uh, a real video. Um, the third category is uh, uh, accidents. Um, so this is kind of undesirable things an AI system does that its designer did not intend. So my general picture of this is, uh, you know, we're uh, more and more moving towards uh, things like reinforcement learning, where an agent interacts uh, with its environment in a very entangled way, more complex environments where they do the interaction, and systems that are given more autonomy because they're able to do more things end to end. And the more we have that, the more the link from kind of what we d designed the system to do, right? What our intention was when we kind of created the system to uh, all the little sub decisions that we've delegated it to, the more there is the potential for some of those sub decisions to be things we didn't want because the link kind of gets weaker and weaker, right? It's we can trust our AI systems to do tasks and subtasks more, and so that's a good thing. But kind of the longer that chain grows and the weaker the link grows, the more there is the potential for something to go wrong. So. Uh, these days, things like uh, you know car crashes and self-driving cars, uh, financial things like the the flash crash, uh, accidents in factory robots. If you had systems controlling uh, power grids, things that could go wrong with them, and in the long run, uh, catastrophes that might go wrong with what uh, OpenPhil calls uh, transformative AI. So uh, you know, kind of the. Uh, the cartoonish version of this is the, you know, the, the kind of Nick Bostrom's idea that the world could be filled with, uh, with, with paper clips. That's uh, kind of not, not really my picture of what, uh, what, what I think will, will happen. But I think the general point that if you have kind of a very powerful system doing many levels of things, um, that, you know, that, 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 that there's the potential for something to go wrong. And since it's a very powerful system, that, that thing going wrong could be, could be potentially catastrophic. So, Actually, personally, I, I worry about all of these, and uh, if anything, I actually maybe even worry about uh, uh, mis misuse more more than I uh, I worry about about accidents. But uh, as you know, as a technical person, uh, I feel like accidents are a place I can start, where uh, you know I don't I don't need some uh, some politician to uh, to implement some plan that I want, which is uh, you know it's really really hard to to make politicians implement reasonable plans. Um, and uh, you know, so it, it's something kind of uh, you know that uh, that that we can start start on now, um, and maybe even will be helpful for for the other stuff. Um, we do do some stuff at at, at OpenAI on, on on a couple of these. I'm uh, I represent OpenAI on the board of an organization called the Partnership on AI, which uh, is kind of a, a group of AI organizations like you know Google, Facebook, uh, Triple Triple AI that kind of tries to to set policy on on some of these, and you know and uh, kind of give give the the industry and the AI research community's opinion, but uh, that's kind of a small fraction of my time. I probably spend most of it on this uh, this uh, accident stuff. So uh, about about a year ago, um, 
I, I and some colleagues back when I was at Google wrote a paper called Concrete Problems in AI Safety that kind of tried to lay out a version of, uh, you know, problems that you have with accidents, tried to, tried to categorize them, and was kind of a call to, you know, to, to my colleagues to, uh, to, to work more on these problems than, uh, than, than we had uh, done in the past. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff we, we say in the paper, but, uh, you know, one, one way you can kind of break down the way that things can go wrong is, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm a designer of an AI system and I wanted it to do something. Um, and something goes wrong and it, it fails catastrophically. So what are the ways in which that can happen? Um, I, we kind of divide it up into, into kind of two causes and, you know, a third that we can, uh, you know, kind of, kind of remind people is, uh, is also important. Uh, one is the wrong objective function. Um, so, you know, as, as I'll discuss, if you optimize for the wrong thing, even in very subtle ways, you can get uh, systems that do something radically different from what you, you intended them to do. Uh, cases where you have the right objective function, but something has gone wrong in the learning process. So this is like training the system on, uh, on um, you know, American accented speech and then trying to use it on uh, on British accented speech and having having something uh, having something uh, go 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 wrong with the uh, the process and we're kind of you know are already seeing this kind kind of thing in uh, self driving cars and similar systems and then then a reminder that all all ML systems are built on top of a software stack um, so software implementation bugs or uh, security security vulnerabilities with the software all of those things apply to ML systems in addition to the ML specific problems that uh, that arise. With, uh, with, with ML systems. So one way to think about uh, you know, a AI safety and AI risk is that we're building another layer on top of a stack, stack of things that are already uh, kind of uh, vulnerable and error prone in, in a number of ways. So uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start by talking a little bit about the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the second thing, which is uh, you, know, you had the right objective function, but something, something went wrong. And then, then I'll talk mostly about wrong objective function, which is kind of the area in which my, my research and those of my colleagues has, uh, has recently focused. So, uh, you know, just a simple example of this is, uh, you know, these are, these are two video games where I trained a reinforcement learning system to, uh, to play them, two, two kind of simple flash games. So uh, RL is, uh, is, you know, quite good at, at learning tasks like these uh, video games. It's amazing what it can do. It's just trying to maximize its score by going along this track as fast as possible. So, uh, you know, you can, you can get really good at this particular game. And then, then I give you another, uh, Another video game that's uh, basically similar to this game, um, and uh, if I just take the, the policy that I learned on this game and try and try and transfer it to another seemingly different game, it's it's basically the same racing game, but uh, you know different colors and uh, scenery that's a little bit different. All right, well this isn't going to be uh, nearly as surprising, but uh, basically uh, the the thing I'm trying to illustrate here is uh, basically you take this policy that's really great at uh, one racing game and you just uh, deploy it without uh, modifying it to another racing game and uh, it uh, it doesn't do so great, and so uh, you know the the applications to self-driving cars should be uh, should be pretty obvious here. And in fact, uh, people who work on self-driving cars worry about this problem a lot, right? There's all kinds of problems that are out of distribution, like uh, you know Google had one story about how like they ran into um, you know one of their self-driving cars ran into a woman chasing a duck across the road. It's like they just never seen anything like that before, but uh, you know they were they were able to deal with it because they uh, they thought about it. So. Um, uh, you know, bad consequences of distributional shift can already be real. So uh, many of you may remember the uh, the uh, the Google Gorilla incident. So this is when uh, Google's photo captioning algorithm uh, uh, basically uh, tagged some African American people as uh, as as gorillas. Um, so uh, turned out actually, you know, this this wasn't them uh, failing failing to be careful or being idiots or, or anything like that. You know, they they'd actually thought about this problem and, and had rules like, uh, you know, um, if, uh, you know, if there's, if there's an animal anywhere in, 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 in a picture, don't, don't tag, don't tag anything in that picture as a human. They had all these kind of hard coded rules to kind of prevent this, this kind of offensive stuff. But, uh, you know, if something's far enough out of distribution, you're known that like won't, won't even recognize that, uh, that, 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 that there's a problem at all. I think in this particular case, there were certain photos that were backlit in a certain way that like confused the neural net. And so, uh, you know, this is this is kind of merely a classifier, but uh, you know, you imagine if you kind of deploy this in more powerful systems, that uh, a lot of things can go wrong. So uh, mostly going to be talking about uh, bad objective functions. So uh, you know, uh, our our current uh, AI systems have this really weird limitation. So uh, you know, you 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 know, probably familiar with uh, very powerful AI systems that can do things like uh, you know, play play chess and go very well. 
Um, but uh, you know, one thing that's hidden from those systems is a uh, curious property of chess and Go is that the, uh, the, the optimization and the behavior is incredibly complex, right? The strategies that you use to play chess and Go are incredibly complex, but uh, the goals are actually very simple. In chess, you're just trying to checkmate the king. In Go, you're just trying to have more, uh, more territory. And actually, this is a requirement of our reinforcement learning systems, because if you want to run something by trial and error 100 million times, you have to be able to evaluate your performance in, in an automated fashion. Um, if a human needed to evaluate this, you couldn't, couldn't do it 100 million times. By contrast, real-world tasks often have very high-level, fuzzy, or complicated goals. So what if I want to arrange the furniture in a room to look nice, engage in realistic and informative dialogue with humans, or you know, something that I would want a very powerful AI system to do, plan and execute a mission to Mars? Um, we, we currently kind of uh, fudge around this by uh, finding very simple pro proxies for our complex goals and uh, you know, trying to do the best we, we can with them. But uh, this often leads to unexpected and, and in fact, often very unsafe behavior. Um, a general principle here is Goodhart's law. When a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. What that means is you know, if I have some metric that's simple, it's 99% correlated with what I want or appears so, and I optimize it really hard, uh, that correlation is dynamic and it will go down, and I don't get the thing I, uh, I intended to get. So uh, hopefully this video will play. Um, it will not. Um, this, is, uh, this is an example of uh, a boat race. Um, so uh, it's like a little flash game where, where you are, you're racing a boat and you know, you're trying to uh, complete, complete a course. Um, and you get uh, points along the way for, uh, for doing something. So because the flash game is kind of enclosed, uh, the, only, uh, the only really available objective function is uh, you know, the points that you get for uh, being, being along the, the, the boat race. And, uh, um, you know, you might think that because the points are laid out uh, in front of the entire race, that uh, you know it would it would cause the agent to actually uh, you know complete complete the course in the right way because it, it looks pretty correlated. But actually, uh, RL is uh, is incredibly clever, and so uh, instead of completing the course, it goes backwards. These are the things you need to click to get points, um, and uh, it finds this lagoon that's just kind of pretty far off the course, and it can get points by doing that. And uh, so if you train this for a few hours, it uh, figures out that uh, you know, despite not completing the course at all, it can uh, get, get most of its points just by kind of going around in circle, getting these turbos, accelerating, setting itself on fire, and just doing it all over again. Um, so uh, you, know, you could say, well, you, know, you get what you ask for, right? I mean, uh, you, know, you didn't actually incentivize this thing to finish the course, so of course it's not going to not going to optimize for, uh, for finishing the course. What's, what's so interesting about that? It's just that the, uh, the, the video game is broken. Um, but I think my response to that is that in some sense, reality is broken, right? If you have, uh, if you have a robot, you only have sensors on things that are, that are very close to you. You don't see the whole state of the world. And it's always easier to see simple things than more complicated things. It's easier to comprehend simple things than it is to, to comprehend more complicated things. So, so I think this is a very kind of ge ge generalizable and uh, uh, um, you know, general general problem that can happen. Um, so as, as something very closely related to this, uh, this, um, this thing which in the press was called uh, uh, a backflipping noodle. Um, so this is something that looks like a pretty simple task, right? This thing only has a few joints. The action space would look simple. But uh, something that's totally crazy is despite the fact that we can play chess and go uh, better than any human player, uh, until our paper, it was literally not possible to make a backflip as elegant as that. Uh, n nowhere, nowhere near. So why is this hard? It's because it's hard to specify the objective function, right? If I wanted to go joint by joint and say, uh, what exactly do these joints need to do to make something that constitutes a backflip? Uh, it's actually very difficult. We had engineers uh, you know, spend hours trying to hand, hand design a reward function, and you end up with this kind of janky thing where it's, you know, its leg is crashing, crashing into its, its stub, and it looks, uh, it looks, uh, it looks much less uh, uh, elegant. But so uh, we came up with a method that, uh, that actually allows you to, uh, to do this. So the way it works is, uh, is pretty simple. You just put a, you put a human in the loop, and then you be very clever about sparsity. Um, so uh, the idea is you have an agent running in the background. Um, and uh, you know, at first, it's uh, just doing totally random things. And every once in a while, it shows an example of what it's doing to the human. Um, two examples. And the human clicks whether the left or the right is more like the behavior it wants. Nothing about the behavior is pre-programmed into the system. The, uh, the, the agent is literally just trying to figure out from what the human clicks what it wants. 
and then in the background it's using reinforcement learning to try and display the behavior that the human wants. So it starts out random, and uh, then humans give some feedback on it, and then it goes off and says, let me, let me try and manipulate the environment to do what the human wants the best I can, and uh, then it brings back two more examples of behavior to the human. Do you mean this or do you mean that? The human says, I meant more, I meant more like this. The agent updates it, its model, and in the background it tries to manipulate the environment to do something more like what, uh, what, what it thinks the, uh, the, the human wants. So, uh, you know, behind the hood, the normal way an RL algorithm works is, uh, you know, the environment gives observations to the agent, the agent takes actions, and it observes, and normally there's a reward coming in, and the reward is something fixed, like did you win or not in Go, or in the, in the case of the boat agent, um, how many points did you get? Um, what we did was we, we replaced the reward with a reward predictor, which is kind of a, uh, like, you know, an, an avatar for what it thinks the human wants. Um, so we had this reward predictor, which is another neural net, in addition to the policy and value function that run, run the RL algorithm, and this thing is fed examples of human feedback, and then as the agent acts in the environment, it, uh, it gives, gives more examples of behavior, asks the humans to label it, and that, uh, that, that trains the reward predictor. So the human is kind of involved in every process of training the AI system. It doesn't have one objective function, it has an objective function that adapts and learns over time as it figures out what it is that the human wants. Um, so uh, one of the tricks is uh, you could never do this if you wanted to just use uh, reinf if you if you wanted to um, basically have the human look at everything that the reinforcement learning learning agent produces. So uh, you know things like AlphaGo and even very simple Atari games. I have to go through something like a hundred million time steps um, in order in order to learn. So you know that 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 ends up being uh, you know many many weeks or months of uh, of, of real human time. So uh, our method is able to uh, basically request uh, human preference feedback on only about 1% of the experience. So, uh, you know, instead of, uh, you know, 10 million frames or so, you have 10,000 frames. And if, uh, if a video is, uh, is 25 frames, then it really only comes down to about a, a few hundred uh, uh, pieces of feedback that you have to give on those, uh, those short, uh, those short uh, video clips. So we're able to train, uh, you know, some of these simple robotics tasks in, uh, in about half an hour and Atari tasks in about, uh, in about um, an hour or two. Um, so uh, just to make the point a little better, ah, oh God. Um, so uh, you know, this is the the game of uh, of uh, in, uh, of Enduro and Atari. So the usual goal of Enduro, when you have a reward function, is to uh, basically pass the cars in front of you as much as you can. Um, and uh, so what this was intended to show is that um, uh, you know you can train this to two different goals. So here, I basically trained this system not to pass other cars, but to keep even with them. Um, there's nothing in the emulator that gives, gives me a good handle to uh, figure out how to reward that. I just watched the thing play Enduro a bunch of times and rewarded it when it stayed exactly even with other cars. And this was designed to be a video of um, an agent that is exactly trying to race past the other cars, where I've reinforced it and rewarded it for racing past the other cars. So the idea is, you know, I can have basically the same set of, the same set of algorithms, the same environment, and with by merely changing what I decide to give feedback on, I can cause the agent to do two very different things in the environment. I'm not limited to a reward function that I can code. I can, get, I can let the agent do anything that I want. Um, here are some more tasks we're, we're able to make it happen. Uh, so this bar on the, uh, the right is uh, our reward predictor. So basically this thing goes really high when the agent is happy and thinks that it's done something really great. So like in Pong, um, you know, it goes up a little bit when the agent returns, and then it goes way up when the agent scores a point. In Sequest, when the agent shoots one of these, uh, these evil fish, uh, the reward predictor uh, 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 goes up. So again, uh, it doesn't know anything about score. We completely hid the score from it. We basically taught it on its own to understand that uh, winning, winning a point is good and losing a point is bad. Knocking out these blocks is good. Shooting the fish is good. Dying is bad. Um, and uh, so yeah, here, here, here are some uh, kind of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, graphs from the paper where um, you know, the, the purple is basically uh, you know, how, how well you do um, when uh, you, uh, you, know, you use this human, human preference learning, even in a case where uh, you know, the, the game has this exact reward that you can just, um, you know, you could just, uh, you know, you could just learn from the, from, the, from the exact reward. And so 
the, the takeaway is that most of the time you can do almost as well, even learning a pre-specified reward, if you hide that reward from yourself and just have a human uh, 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 learn it, uh, you can learn in almost, almost as few RL steps. And in fact, sometimes you can actually do better. Um, one reason you can do better is that often humans are better at providing rewards than the actual game. So in Enduro, a problem with Enduro is that you don't get any rewards at all until you pass, until you pass some cars. When you start, the cars are zooming past you. Um, and so the agent often doesn't know how to explore enough to figure out how to pass cars um, at all. Um, but a human will give it a reward for being passed by other cars a little bit more slowly, right? If a human looks at it and it's like it's going forward a little bit versus it's not going forward very much, a human will reward that. So the human kind of corrects the flaws in how the agent uh, rewards uh, uh, tasks. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, rather than relying on just one reward function, often the human can give a more naturalized reward function that makes it, the, it easier for the agent to learn. So, for example, in tasks like Enduro, you can actually learn better using this method. Even though this is a method that's kind of designed for safety purposes, you can actually learn, learn an ML task, one where you already have a defined reward and shouldn't, shouldn't even need a method like this, better than, than uh, you know, than, uh, than you otherwise would. Um, this is also true of, uh, so we tried this on a bunch of simulated robotics tasks, not just the back flipping noodle. And, uh, you know, it turns out uh, mostly it does uh, 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 kind, of, kind of a little worse or, or about as good as the method where you cheat and, and know the reward. But sometimes it, 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 sometimes it even, uh, it even uh, manages to do better. So uh, where, where are we kind of going with this in the, in the long run, right? So, um, you know, uh, right, right, right now we're just kind of clicking left or right on these agents and saying, uh, you know, is left better than right? That often feels like a very thin communication channel where, you know, I really wanted to say, wow, that thing you did was really good. Or like, you know, you, you, you move the paddle here, what you needed to do was move the paddle a little lower. So you can imagine cases where, you know, the human uh, kind of, you know, draws, draws little kind of like football play-like sketches on the, uh, the, uh, the two, uh, you know, the two videos and says, well, you needed to do more of this and less of this. And if you did that, you could probably learn more complicated things with uh, less feedback. And I think the ultimate direction this is going is that we should be able to give our agent instructions in, in natural language, right? So if I think about what would it mean to uh, tell a machine learning system to plan and execute a mission to Mars, it's a totally ill-defined question, right? Like, you know, do, do, you know, I'm taking the humans to Mars. Do they need to be alive? Should I, should I accept a 1% chance of them dying in exchange for them going faster? Or do I need it to be a 0.1%? How many humans are going to Mars? Um, you know, what should if uh, you know if uh, if if the if the if the humans are are radioing back? Does that does that really mean they're alive? What's uh, what's what's going on? So it's this it's this terribly ill-defined task where the only way I can imagine actually having a system that's useful to us that doesn't constantly need to be told what's going on is where a, a system that asks questions to us that asks us to clarify what the particular goals are. So, you know, if we say plan and execute a mission to Mars, it'll say, what's most important to prioritize? Do you want to be extra safe? Do you want to go fast? How many people? Do you intend that they'll come back or that they'll stay? And that somehow, in some way we don't know how to do yet, that uh, these, these words given by the human will be compiled through some language interpreter to, uh, you know, some reward function in some very large vector space, and that the agent will develop a policy based on that, uh, that, that reward function. This is kind of, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the details of this are vague, but I think this is the kind of thing we should be, be aiming for in, 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 in the long run, because, uh, you know, we need to interact with environments, and for that we need something like reinforcement learning, but reinforcement learning itself it just, it just won't cut it. I think it's not going to be able to do tasks of this complexity. And uh, even worse, if it does, I think it'll be very unsafe. Um, so uh, that's kind of the general, general direction we're going with our, our research. You know, next, we're, we're thinking about things like robotics and, and dialogue and, and those kind of tasks. And hopefully, we'll have some work on that soon. Um, just to finally return a little bit to you know, the, the division I gave in the beginning between uh, you know, accidents and misuse and, uh, and other things. You know, there's been all this stuff in the last few weeks about uh, you know, China making pushes in, in AI. And so I think even if we manage to solve all these, uh, you know, all these technical risks, we still have this policy risk, right? Where we have two very powerful countries that are you know, both 
racing very hard to, to develop, uh, develop AI. There's a, there's a concept in international relations called the security dilemma, which says that you can often have a situation where you know, neither side really wants to fight or to be in an adversarial relationship, but they're afraid that if they don't, uh, you know, if they don't prepare themselves, that, that the, you know, the other side will attack them or the other side will have an advantage. So you can get into a situation where uh, you know, basically, basically no one wants to do something destructive, basically no one wants to be adversarial, but it, it happens anyway because you have two very powerful entities that, are, you know, that, that, that see the potential for a very powerful technology, and if they don't get ahead in it, the, the other side will. Um, so I think this is one of the, the looming issues that uh, you know, I think uh, deserves uh, much, much more attention than it's getting, maybe, maybe even more attention than the safety stuff. I just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really quite know what to, to do about it other than to uh, make, people, make people more aware of it and, uh, and try and have uh, something happen with it. So uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of acknowledgments on the concrete problems paper. Uh, basically, uh, Chris Ola, Jacob Steinhardt, Paul Cristiano, John Schulman, these two are now at, at, at OpenAI and da Dan Manet at, uh, at Google. The Learning from Human Preferences paper, the first author on that was, uh, was uh, Paul Cristiano. It was a collaboration between uh, OpenAI and uh, uh, DeepMind, who thinks similarly that uh, safety is an important topic that we need to uh, study more than we did. Actually, one of the co-founders of uh, DeepMind, Shane Lake, uh, participated in this research. And uh, you know, the various institutions that I've been at or collaborated at, OpenAI, DeepMind, and uh, Google Brain, have, uh, have all been uh, I you know, extremely uh, supportive of this work. It uh, seemed weird to everyone when we, uh, when we first started thinking about it. But I think uh, you know, there's been kind of increasing uh, acceptance and institutional support for doing it and scaling it up. This is, I think, mostly for Daniel's talk, although I would love to hear both of your you know, takes on this. Um, so when we're thinking about existential risks like these, how do we, so you, you mentioned this like 10% number, which I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into like how how that was, that, was, that was calculated, and I'm sure there's a lot of smart people thinking about it. Um, but my, my question is more around, like, so there's this AI risk, you know, probability. There's, like, the gray goo risk probability for nanotechnology. There's, like, the probability that CERN is going to smash particles together and create a black hole or, or, or change the, you know, change the, uh, 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 you know, whatever energy state of matter we will exist in. Like, how do you... Which of these should I, should I be worried the most about? And like, and how do I, like, how do I portfolio? Or how do I like kind of allocate my, my my worries between all these scenarios? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you have like a limited amount of worrying time, and you need to make sure that you're using it the right way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. No, I, I totally see the question. So actually, we think about this a lot. I'll be interested if you have thoughts on this, but um, we think a lot about first of all, like. I think you can actually do some estimation of these things uh, and come to numbers that are maybe like qualitatively meaningful. Um, a lot of that has to do with trying to think more concretely about uh, how situations could play out. Um, I don't feel like I have great examples off the top of my head about how to do those kinds of comparisons. But the other factors here are tractability. So there are some problems you look at. So for example, we might worry that there could be a, um, a high energy physics experiment out in space somewhere, you know, naturally occurring, that results in vacuum collapse to a new level of vacuum. And that like, wave is coming towards us at light speed. Uh, and we can't do anything about that. So like, you could worry about it if you like worrying about things. But you're not going to do anything about it. Uh, and I think there are less stark tractability differences in different areas. So maybe there's a particularly promising looking research path in artificial intelligence. That gives you an extra reason to spend more effort working on or thinking about those things. Um, then the third point here is I think there's a sort of like a low hanging fruit effect that can incentivize portfolio approaches. So in each of these areas, maybe you're worried about both uh, risk of pandemic and risk of uh, artificial intelligence. And you also think that there's outstanding potential for like some cheap scalable energy source. And you want to figure out how to balance among those things. Uh, often it's the case that the first bit of support you put into something will result in like a really great amount of learning uh, about that area or will result in sort of like uh, a step change in whether there's any progress happening, whether there's any growth in the field. Uh, and I think that sort of pushes you in the direction of even if there were like 
really significant differences in the probability of these risks, it could still make sense to spread your resources among several of them. So that's not like a super concrete answer. There's also like um, your comparative advantage. So like if you work in artificial intelligence, then your comparative advantage is probably not in like managing synthetic biology or something like that. Um, so these are all tools that I find like, I don't know that many people who, when they take all of these things into account, still feel sort of like paralyzed about what they can productively engage with. Um, although a lot of people I know spend a lot of time worrying about a lot of things. So, you know, feel free to worry as much as you please. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, a point I often make when uh, thinking about this is, uh, you know, I think humanity faces a lot of risks. And in fact, if I think about human civilization, it seems basically unstable to me. Um, the, uh, the, the last year, um, you know, I think one of the lessons you could take from the last year is the, the idea that I, I, I'm actually not entirely confident that in the long run, kind of uh, di digital communications is, uh, you know, compatible with uh, democracy and, and complex human society. Um, that, uh, you know, we invent new technologies every day and uh, they often have subtle effects and sometimes we can't handle those, uh, those, those subtle effects. So uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, if, you know, if we were to just keep going on for like, you know, 200 or 300 years, the, the way, the, you know, the, just kind of the way we were with, uh, you know, just gradually advancing technology, that's actually a very, very dangerous, uh, very dangerous situation. And there's a lot of ways that, uh, that we could d destroy ourselves. Um, you know, we've talked about risks from AI, but I think one of the benefits from AI is it's one of the few things that could reduce and maybe even end many or all of those risks. Um, if, if, we, if, we, if we really got it right. Um, that it could you know, help us to make ourselves smarter, could change a lot of things that have been fixed about the human condition you know, since, since, since we evolved from, uh, from chimpanzees. Um, and so whatever the risks are in, in AI, one of the reasons I'm most interested in AI is that I think it has the potential to eliminate most of the other risks that we face. But of course, if we're going to do that, then we have to worry about the risk that that technology itself has. Um, and so that, that, that's what takes me to caring about this more than, more than I care about other risks, although I, you know, there, there are a number of other risks that, you know, that, that I find uh, quite, quite disturbing. So uh, one of the categories of risks that you both mentioned was basically misuse. And um, I mean, I guess the thing about misuse is that it's very much sort of in the eye of the beholder when a person's misuse is referring to somebody else's intended use. Um, and so, I mean, how do you think about sort of creating policy or basically making policy, politics, society robust to, like, best able to make these kinds of decisions about misuse and sort of most robust to bad actors? Um, I think that you shouldn't take the things I say on this point as coming from much expertise, like, one of the things I want to do is find people who know about these things and give them money so they can figure them out. But I think that there's a lot uh, that we can learn from history and from history of politics and history of political philosophy. Um, that a, a powerful tool here is like uh, de-pessimizing or, or um, so for example, like when we're trying to set up rule of law, uh, there is a lot more concern for finding some minimal set of things that we want to try to make sure won't be happening like making sure that people aren't in fear of physical violence all the time, uh, and, uh, and then try to make those things happen. And then as society gets better as a result of those things, we're more able to uh, get together as a community and figure out what things we wanna do next. So there's this sort of incremental progress that seems pretty promising to me. Um, and what, what I think that would imply is like starting with the things that are most widely agreed upon, that are most clearly uh, things that, that would improve the human condition and then sort of move up from there and hope that the effects from people getting uh, richer and incurring less risk in their day-to-day -day lives and having more hope for you know, their children's lives being better than theirs are, that that makes people more able to step back and think in a serious way about how to cooperate with people who are more and more different from them. Um, but I'll repeat again at the end. I, I really don't think you should ask me this question. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, I mean, one of, the, one, of the thing, one of the ways I think about misuse is, uh, 
you know, there are many technologies today that you can misuse. Uh, so, uh, so the real question is, what's, what's, new about, what's new about AI? So I think the way we've traditionally handled misuse is a kind of game theoretic or balance of power solution. Um, where, you know, I can take a gun and shoot someone, no one's stopping me from doing that, but uh, if I do that, you know, the police will arrest me or shoot me, and so, you know, uh, you know I, have, I have very little incentive to, to actually do that, right? There's a lot, you know, like my, my power is very small compared to the power of the rest of the people in the world, and, you know, uh, and even if I was, you know, much more rich or powerful, it would still be the case that my power was very small compared to the power of the rest of the people in the world. Um, my, my concern about, about AI is uh, dis discontinuities of power. Um, so I think when thinking about misuse, the things that we should put most of our attention on and that we might need to address in novel ways are cases where a discontinuity or a, a, a very, very rapid, very sharp concentration of power could occur. Um, of course, you know, whenever there's a novel way to attack people, even within the balance of power, we have to address those. But the things that worry me the most are the cases where you would have this sharp discontinuity. stems from sort of its creation moment, or a lot of people worry about the singularity, but looking at a lot of this, um, if you create something that's super smart, it's going to have to go out in the world and learn. So talk a little bit about the research being done to speed up reinforcement learning. I mean, is there a chance that, like, you create an evil AI, but it's going to have to go like a child, it's going to take it 20 years to learn anything, or are these techniques getting faster where, you know, you could create it in literally in two hours and knows everything there is to know. What, what kind of stuff is happening there? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that's a, a good question. So some some set some sets of distinctions here. Um, you know, I think that uh, so right now where we are is exactly as you say that if uh, you know to train a system to do one thing takes an enormous amount of training. So if you wanted to train a robot from scratch to do something in the real world, it takes a lot of a lot of interaction with the real world, more time than you could possibly take. Um, if we want to train a system to play Go, then of course we can speed that up, but it's still playing, you know. 10 million or 100 million games. Um, uh, people, I think, at both OpenAI and DeepMind are, are very excited about this concept called meta-learning, which is the idea that uh, instead of training an agent in a single environment, you train it on a wide distribution of environments. So like the Flash games I showed, you could train an agent from scratch over and over again to play a thousand Flash games, and then it learns how to learn a Flash game. So then you go through this long training process initially once for a wide range of tasks. And then when you want it to learn a new task, it learns that new task quickly because you've taught it to, to, to do the learning activity of learning new tasks quickly. Um, so I, I expect that at some point, perhaps some point soon, we will make a lot of progress on this kind of l learning fast thing. So the model I would think about, and you, know, like you, you might call it a threat model if you're talking about what you're worried about, you might call it a product model for you know, all, all the positive facts, is a system that takes a long time to train, but then once it's trained in kind of a very broad way, can then learn to do new things in new environments very quickly. Um, those, are, those are the kinds of systems that I think we will have in the coming decades. <laughs> so he's been asking for uh, more regulation in, in AI research, and I struggle to understand what that even means. Like, several researchers have made the same point, like what government bureaucratic innovation could, you know, um, prevent, like, killer AI or whatever. Like, what, are there any examples that are meaningful? Yeah, um, so I, I, I mean, I'm employed by, by Elon Musk. Um, I, I shouldn't, uh, like... Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I work with OpenAI open and our, our policy stuff. Um, I, I think I have to say here that we're, we're thinking about what, what we'd like to do and, and that, that I don't have uh, that, that much to say, to say at this time. Um, I think, um, you know, if you, if you think about, uh, uh, about, you know, regulation, I think, I think what I can say is, you know, there may be some areas like military use of, of, of AI where, uh, you know, some, some type of regulation or laws, laws make sense. Um, and you know, I also think that you know, in the long run, if we're if we're training powerful AI systems, at some point society is going to have to grapple with who is allowed to use them and for what purpose. Um, you know, we're not used to thinking of AI systems as uh, you know being being like you know drugs or something that you know that that can have uh, you know a, a, a dangerous impact. But you know, at some point, you know, compute hardware and trained models are going to be some of the most the most powerful things in the world. So in some form, we're going to have to grapple with that. I don't I don't I don't know what the 
I don't know what the right the right the right answer is, but uh, you know it might it, it, it might prove that uh, you know having having such things d d you know d distributed distributed everywhere is you know that that there are going to need to be at least some rules about about how it's used. I don't know what those rules look like, and I certainly wouldn't know how to implement one now. But uh, this this very may very well happen eventually. to know what, what do you think is in terms of the research trajectory, how is it different in terms of the capabilities, like generalization capabilities of uh, the new machine learning papers that we're seeing compared to some of the existing, uh, like the other, like uh, what last, like a vast body of uh, multitask learning papers, because um, like essentially what you're trying to learn is uh, basically unpack this manifold of AI tasks and try to understand learn representations that are transferable from one task to another. And so I want to see if you have any comments on the specific examples. So, so I think up until about a year ago, the general approach to multitask learning was that you would basically train a system on, on, you know, on kind of different tasks and then try and fine tune it and transfer it to a new task. So it was kind of like, you know, I would like, uh, I would, you know, I would, tr I would train a system to play Space Invaders and I would pl train a system to play Pong and I'd take a network that was kind of an average of those and then I'd try and transfer that network to some new task. What we do now sounds the same but is, is actually subtly different, which is that I take a single network and I put it through the process a thousand times of learning from scratch, not just playing an episode, but learning from scratch a thousand games a thousand times. So it's actually learning the process of how to learn a new game. So uh, I think uh, the previous literature also made the distinction between transfer learning and multi-task multi learning. Yes. Multi-task learning sounds much like what you're describing. Uh, so no, no. M multitask learning just means that you have like a single model with many heads that uh, that kind of learns to do a number of tasks at the same time. Um, what we have here is like I might have like some meta parameters in a meta policy. And basically the meta parameters describe, it, the meta parameters are basically a formula for when I see a new environment, I, the meta parameters unroll into some policy that absorbs information in the new environment that it's never seen before and then learns over time a policy in that, in that, in that, in that new environment. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit like, um, you know, it's a little bit like uh, the process of development or something. You can think of the meta parameters as being a little bit like a genome. They basically, when, you, when you're put in, 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 in a new environment and you start as a blank slate, the meta parameters tell you that they're basically a recipe for constructing uh, parameters that allow you to learn and interact with a totally new environment. So like a human brain is a tool like this, right? If I, if I, if I take, or the human genome is a tool like this. I take the human genome, I like, instantiated in a person who's in a totally new environment. They have a different set of experiences than someone else with the same genome might have. And they, uh, you know, they, they go off and become, become a different person. Um, I think m the classical multitask learning is more like, um, you know, I'm, I'm one person and I have like a hundred different, different kind of views on the world. And my, um, you know, my, my policy is like mostly the same, but you fine tune me a little to do each of these tasks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, can you give me some concrete example of what these meta parameters are and how would somebody engineer that? Sure. Even in a limited uh, domain like Atari games. Yeah. So, uh, recent about a year ago, OpenAI published a paper called uh, RL squared. So the idea is that you basically have um, <clears throat> you basically have an RNN and. Uh, the parameters of your, your the recurrent neural network, or, or an LSTM, and the parameters of the RNN are uh, the, the meta parameters. So basically, you uh, you start with this RNN, and every time you're put in a, put in a new environment, every observation you make goes into the hidden state of your RNN, and uh, then comes out comes out with an action. And the the set of things you've learned as you proceed through the environment. So the RNN doesn't just proceed for one episode; it proceeds for the whole process of learning over that environment. And the activations of the hidden state of the RNN is used to store everything you've learned about that very one specific environment. 
Um, and so the metaparameters are the uh, weights of the, the RNN and the object level parameters that are specific to an environment rather than persisting across environments are uh, the, the hidden state of the, uh, of, of the RNN. So that, that's, that's an example of how you could divide the two. Um, so you mentioned uh, people have a lot of disagreement about timelines. Um, some people think it's going to be very far in the future, some people short, but uh, a lot of the estimates are at least 10 years in the future. Uh, how do you make sure that the work that you do now is still relevant as the methods and techniques that people develop change? Yep. So uh, I think the general philosophy with the human preference learning stuff is to try and, try and develop, instead of things that work in one situation, try and develop general widgets that can be kind of adapted to whatever models end up being built or that only need to be changed a little bit. So if you forget about safety and just think about um, you know, machine learning, uh, examples of these widgets are things like you know, convolutional neural networks, LSTMs, uh, uh, you know, attention models, Neural, neural Turing machines, you know, uh, optimization algorithms like Atom, where they're kind of things that, uh, you know, they're very general in their nature. And so uh, you can, um, you know, even if they were developed for one particular problem, they may work for lots of other problems. And even if I develop lots of new ways of doing things, like let's say I shift from model free RL to model based RL, or, you know, I shift from object level learning to meta learning, still the case that I can use things like LSTMs in those models. So in particular in the human preferences, this is kind of a widget where it's something that you know, transforms a certain amount of availability of human time plus an RL algorithm into an aligned RL algorithm. And so we will, I think, and the directions we're thinking about are, you know, how do we make this compatible with meta-learning? Right? How could you use this to guide the meta-learning process uh, to, to learn to explore? Would it be compatible with, uh, say, a model-based RL algorithm instead of a model-free RL algorithm? So we're thinking about all these modifications, and I think the model is, you know, whatever is the latest powerful thing that OpenAI comes out with, you know, like the bot that just, just beat Dota. A few months after that, I want a way to, you know, align the goals of that, that particular system, right? I want, I want safety to always, to always be right, right on the heels of the system that's being produced, and maybe eventually something that's thought about as the system itself is being built. And if we can maintain that invariant, then it, it doesn't matter how long it takes until, you know, until, until we get to, to general intelligence. We just have to keep doing that, um, you know, and, and if we can keep doing that, then we'll be good. Are there other general modules that you are yeah. considering besides? Um, I think uh, robustness, robustness and generalization. If we found a way to get better at robustness and generalization, or at least detect when uh, you know a system wasn't likely to generalize. So if instead you had an RL policy that basically uh, you know it, it basically told you when you know you tra you trained it to uh, you know to play this car racing game and then you give it another car racing game, it basically says sorry, I'm, I'm not designed to do this. I'm not going to take any actions in this environment. Um, or at least tells you that it needs a certain kind of data to be trained on. That seems like something pretty, pretty generalizable, where it's, you know, it's not going to be fixed to a particular architecture. Uh, OK, so I think this is a really important uh, research area that deserves to be treated seriously and with respect. Uh, I therefore have a question about science fiction. Um, so I feel like this is uh, probably a somewhat frustrating area to be working in because uh, there are kind of degenerate popular culture embedded in consciousness. It's either uh, sort of the world ends with the development of uh, artificial intelligence, or um, it's completely ignored, like Terminator versus Star Wars. Um, do you see any, like personally, do you see any uh, popular culture that you engage in that you take seriously, uh, I don't know, grappling with what a uh, stably coexistent society might look like? The, the, yeah, the culture novels by 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 in in M Banks. Uh, they're not they're not perfect as a, as as a world, and uh, um, I think I think he doesn't do do as good a job of presenting a utopia as, as you could. But uh, I think they might be the closest closest thing that exists, where uh, you know machines are incomparably powerful and they uh, they exist alongside uh, uh, humans and seem 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 to benefit the uh, the, the the humans and uh, the world that's created is uh, is a pretty good world that persists for a long time. It's a little bit of a human. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, I think maybe ultimately AI could help help humans themselves get smarter. There isn't that much of that in the culture series. I think that's one of the flaws. Yeah, there's a um, oh, what is this author? Um, oh, it's gonna bug me. I'm gonna have to get back to you on this. Werner Vinge. 
Uh, no. no, no, different, different one. I think one of the problems here, though, is that like um, a lot of these kinds of risks and the kinds of outcomes that we could get, I don't think really lend themselves to like a classic dramatic structure necessarily. So like it's fun to have a team of humans like racing against the clock to like put some explosives or something like that, and that's not really the story that that we have here. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, yeah, I feel like that makes your job harder. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> short-term impact of AI is actually destabilizing to like societal cohesion, to democracy, then we're not going to get to any of these good outcomes, right? Um, or even, even some of the harder problems of AI safety. Uh, so I guess how do we think about understanding and mitigating those risks? And I mean, the, sort of, the other part of this is what about sort of funding for these external mitigations that aren't part of AI, but like, for example, let's say you've got a risk of um, you know, any content, um, being able to generate arbitrary, arbitrary videos and images um, representing anything. Well, then you can talk about signing infrastructure across all the, all the platforms that we use for images and video and getting that and the, and the UX involved in that being to be used wholesale. Like, where does, where does sort of thinking about those sorts of policies or those sorts of human product development and getting that to happen for companies? Where does that fit? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I don't know how satisfying you're going to find the answer. It, it took us uh, quite a while on the funding side to feel like we got enough familiarity with some of these issues to start doing some basic steps, where the basic steps are like, find researchers who care about these things and who have reasonable plans for having an impact and then funding them. Uh, and I think often it's the case that with, um, if there's a mechanism uh, by which AI has impacts that go through societal forces, uh, by reshaping norms or by, by having uh, a sort of like complex social effect, it just feels much harder to form a concrete picture of what you could do that is reasonably likely to have a good impact on the world. It's not an area that has an awesome track record uh, for, um, for like reliably figuring out which interventions, like if you're worried that your culture is gonna spin out of control in one direction or another, maybe as a result of some technology, maybe as a result of economic forces, it's just like, in a lot of ways, it feels like a much harder problem than actually trying to figure out how to get AI systems to like learn complex human goals. Um, just because there's like this meteorological system that you're trying to interact with. Um, so I, d I don't feel on the funding side like we've gotten a clear enough picture to be confident and start moving forward on these things. It's certainly something that we keep talking to people about and keep trying to figure out more. Uh, but it's just like less mature in my view. I'm, I'm pretty worried about these, uh, these short-term things. I mean, I, I hear the concern, uh, you know, could, could, could the world fall apart before, before we even get to uh, tra transformative AI? Um, you, know, I, you know, I think in, in general, uh, you know, all, all of these things will kind of still exist within the usual, usual balance of power framework of humans, which of course has, hasn't always worked, worked that well. So, you know, you know I feel like uh, it does seem like a lot, a lot of bad things could happen when, you know, we can, we can generate, you know, weaponized, weaponized fake news and make make drones that that do anything. I, I, I guess I guess I'm hopeful that these things won't, uh, you know, won't be so severe that they'll like literally kind of, you know, d derail or destroy civilization. Right? Civilization's been around for uh, for for a long time. It doesn't have to be around for all, all that much longer before uh, you know we we create uh, we create tr truly general AI. So I, I hope we'll we'll muddle through. But uh, you know, it's it's definitely something that I'm. Uh, it's definitely something that I'm concerned about. As a technical researcher, I really have no idea what to do about it. Sounds like Daniel has only slightly more idea what to do about it than I do. When, when we're looking at, like when, when I was talking about strategic risks and we're looking at field building, you'll notice I didn't have a slide describing like all the cool things we're doing to build that field right now. I think it's just because it's like a much more confusing and difficult problem than this case where we're like, we have these technical problems. Oh great, there's like a field of AI and machine learning researchers who are already pretty interested in a lot of these problems or problems that are close nearby. Whereas, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's, um, actually I should clarify. There are a bunch of people who are working on related issues from a variety of perspectives. It just feels less like there's a unified narrative that we can use in order to really be confident about making progress. Are there other examples 
is our research and um, I guess is there a lot of attention toward misalignment at this sort of lower level like existing misalignment issues um, I know that there's some attention I, I don't know that there is a really there's not like a really large amount of attention, as far as I know, on any kind of misalignment besides the kind that just manifest as like your product breaks completely. Um, this issue of like alignment, for example, like uh, maybe it would be nice if YouTube would check after you watched a video, like wait a week and then say, hey, remember you watched that last Saturday? Are you like glad? Is your life better because you did that? Um, and then maybe it would be more aligned with your on reflection values or something like that. Is that the kind of thing you're you're thinking of? Yeah, well it's, it's interesting framing that. Like I've never heard I thought about this. I've never I never thought about it as a misalignment problem until today. This is what this is my area of research. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting to consider it in that frame and then maybe we can apply some of these approaches to that. I think this is totally a, a cool area to think about. So yeah I think I think we should probably divide it into into two cases, right? So I think one, one case is like easier to solve technically and, and harder to solve socially, and the other is the reverse. Um, so uh, one, one reason it could happen is because uh, you know, Facebook has some ads, and they, they, what they actually want to optimize for is what causes people to click the most. Um, and so then it's not like uh, they had the wrong objective function by accident. It's that the objective function they're trying to optimize you for is not the objective function you really want to be optimized for. Um, yeah, it's it's well, yeah, it's 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 at least at least in part a, a, a policy problem, right? Where it's like, um, you know, we're we're not we're not really great at, at kind of controlling controlling our own rea reactions and our own and our own attention span. I mean, you can you can you can see this all the time, right? You can you can imagine how it how it radicalizes people. You know, let's let's let you know let's let's imagine you're you know a, a, a liberal or a conservative who's you know like mildly offended by some things the other side does and Facebook shows it to you and you get really mad and you click on it and then it shows it more to you and you get more mad and you know obviously that isn't a great thing but uh, in some sense that that you know that gets optimized for um, the other case is where it's actually really hard to tell what does the human want right what what do I want from uh, you know what do I want from um, you know Facebook or Google or whatever what, what do I want what do I actually want when I use the internet right I, you know I would hope that you know, like makes me a more more enriched, a smarter person in some way. It helps me fulfill my goals. But those things are a lot harder to define than clicks. Um, and so I think that has some something in common with these uh, these these misalignment problems. I worry that it may be almost as hard, right? That uh, you know, to to really solve those problems means uh, means describing what it means for a human to to live to live a good life, which is uh, what we're trying to solve in the in the in the general case. Um, although maybe if we solve the general misalignment problem uh, early on, long before we have AGI, it'll also help us solve that problem. But I, I'm not super optimistic about that possibility.